I don't think the government's learnt any lessons whatsoever. I mean, you know, we've had a lot of t tough talk about what they're going to do to bad employers, but what we haven't seen is any delivery at all. And that's why I think most people in workplaces up there, up and down the country, know we need fundamental political change because the world of work is not working uh, for ordinary working people. Yeah, Paul Novak, General Secretary of the TUC. Yeah, well, this government has presided over an explosion in insecure, low-paid employment, and we've got now record numbers of people on zero-hours contracts, 1.2 million people. And what this means is that people go to work week in, week out, not knowing how many hours they're going to work, not knowing how much is going to be in their pay packets, and it's impossible to bring up a family or plan a life uh, when you're faced with that sort of precarious uh, employment. So I think it's a real failure, an indictment of this government presiding over an explosion of low-paid, insecure work. I mean, we've heard this morning that pay is on the up, that we are, you know, keeping up with the cost of living prices. Is that not right? Well, I, I think, you know, tell that to the millions of people out there who've suffered real terms pay cuts over the course of the last 12 months, uh, two years. And it's great that we're seeing wages finally beginning to tick up. But the reality is, uh, over the last year, uh, bills have gone up. Rent and mortgages have gone up, uh, the cost of the, the weekly shop has gone up. What hasn't gone up is people's wages. So obviously unions are fighting hard to make a difference, to make sure that pay does uh, continue uh, to rise. But this government, I'm afraid, has presided over an explosion, uh, the worst cost of living crisis in our uh, uh, recent history. Uh, and it's another reason why people should vote them out of the next election. Mm, we've also seen a huge uptick in the number of people who are on zero hours contracts. Do you know the number for that? Yeah, well, we've now got 1.2 million people on zero hours contracts contracts that's absolutely that's a record number of, of people in one of the most precarious forms of employment but three million people we know are in low paid and insecure employment and this is particularly the case for black workers who are at the sharp end of the labour market we've seen an additional 500,000 black workers move into insecure employment over the course uh, of the last decade that's on this government's watch and it's really important that they do something about it rather than talking tough uh, about what they want employers to do we need to see legislation that will make difference to people's working lives I mean, we've heard from DWP and we've heard from the skills minister that people like being in zero hours contracts. It's not, is that not the reality? That's not, what they say, uh, that's not what they say when they're asked the question directly about whether or not they prefer to have guaranteed hours. Overwhelming majority of people on zero hours contracts would have prefer to have the certainty of knowing what was going to be in their pay packet every single week. And listen, this government knows it's a problem as well. That's why Conservative ministers over the last few years have promised 20 times in the Houses of Parliament that they're going to introduce an employment bill which will tackle some of these abuses of zero hours contracts, tackle some of the issues around insecure employment. They have signally failed to deliver that bill. And at the end of the day, it's working people who are paying the price uh, for that with this sort of precarious employment. Does it benefit the employer to have a zero hours contract? Well, absolutely. There are employers exploiting these zero hours contracts. What they're doing is transferring the risk of employment from themselves to the people uh, they employ. And you know, it's hard to build any sort of life when you don't know from one week to the next how much uh, you're going to be earning. I think decent employers know that these aren't the right way to hold on to uh, and to motivate staff. Uh, but what we crucially need is legislation that will mean that employers can't exploit zero hours contracts. And this is where a change of government would make a difference. Labour have explicitly committed to end the exploitation of zero hours contracts, to ban fire and rehire, to give unions access to the workplace from day one. These are the sorts of things that would make a difference to ordinary people's working lives. Can you talk to me a little bit about that exploitation? I mean, a lot of business owners might be hearing this and they might think, well, we wouldn't like unions in the workplace and we would actually quite like to keep zero hours contracts in place. I mean, what kind of exploitation? Well, well I, I've, I've been on those picket lines with those Amazon workers in, in Coventry uh, where people are, are, are on low pay. Uh, the work is incredibly intense. Uh, their employer doesn't want a union voice inside uh, the workplace. Uh, and I think actually employers should respect the right of everybody to join a union, to give the staff that choice. I mean, it shouldn't be the employer's choice about whether or not people join a union. It should be the individual uh, uh, workers. And I understand sometimes why employers want to keep unions out of workplaces. In unionised workplaces, people are paid more. They're more likely to have secure hours. They're more likely to have family-friendly working policies. More likely to have pensions, access to skills and training. Unions make a positive difference. But I think most good employers know that there's a value in working alongside. Uh, 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 unions. Unfortunately, not every employer is a good employer. And, you know, I think from this government, we've had far too much carrot and not enough stick for bad employers. I mean, just think about P&O. A year ago, 800 people sat without notice, without consultation. The government promised absolute blue murder, the things they were going to do to P&O, hold people to account. A year on, no one's been prosecuted. The company's not had any fines. 
the uh, senior management team has shared £15 million in bonuses between them, and the government is awarding P&O and its parent company uh, lucrative contracts. I mean, that sends out entirely the wrong message to bad employers. What, what, what lessons have the government learned from that? I don't think the government's learned any lessons whatsoever. I mean, you know, we've heard a lot of t tough talk about what they're going to do to bad employers, but what we haven't seen is any delivery at all. And that's why I think most people in workplaces up there, up and down the country know we need fundamental political change because the world of work is not working uh, for ordinary working people. We've seen it just this week with the announcement from Wilco's, thousands of jobs being placed at risk, pensions being placed at risk. At the same time, senior management handing themselves out millions of pounds uh, in bonus payments, dividends to shareholders, something that's fundamentally broken in Britain's jobs market. What kind of precedent do you think that is setting if Wilco can go bust and people like drive? Well, listen, we know that it's a, it's a difficult trading environment for lots of retailers, but what we've seen also is senior management teams continuing to reward themselves and to reward shareholders, even at the time that are driving businesses uh, to the brink. And I think it would send out entirely the wrong message uh, to employers right across the economy. So, you know, you know, I think we've got responsibility, obviously, to stand alongside those workers at Wilco's who are worried about their livelihoods and their futures, but we've got to try and prevent situations like that ha from happening in the first place, you know. Uh, and one thing we could do, for example, is put workers on the boards of companies. I mean, this happens right across Europe. It would involve workers in the big strategic decisions that impact on their working lives, and it would mean that uh, corporate teams couldn't play fast and loose with people's livelihoods. You've got the UCU have said this morning they are going to be going out on strike again later in the year, they're not going to be marking papers. You've got the doctor's strike just ended today, RMT is still going out on strike. Do you think, um, what kind of message do you think this is sending to the public? Do you think the public are on side with the workers who are going on strike or do you think they're getting bored of it? I think all the evidence is that people understand why workers are taking that difficult decision to take strike uh, action, whether it's in our railways uh, or in our hospitals. Now it's important to say in some sectors like education, for example, in the civil service, workers took strike action, workers voted for industrial action and the government had to come back uh, with better offers uh, on pay. Not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but much better than where we started from. And I think that shows the, the value of workers being prepared to stand up and take collective action, but it also shows the value of negotiation in resolving disputes. And I think, you know, whether it's university employers, whether it's uh, the Department of Health, whether it's the rail employers, the onus is on those employers to get round the table and reach a fair settlement for those workers. Let's bring those disputes to an end, but let's put money in the pockets of those workers who desperately need it. I mean, that frightens a lot of people, doesn't it? Because we often hear about a wage spiral. So if we're, if we're to guarantee these wages, you know, that could send the economy loose. Does that worry you at all? It doesn't worry me at all because there's absolutely no credible evidence at all that it's the wages of supermarket workers or indeed university lectures or work, railway workers that's driving inflation uh, in, in this country. Uh, and so, and, and how could it be when we've had the biggest squeeze on wages in 200 years? People's real-term incomes now lower than they were at the time of the financial crash. So it's not wages that's driving inflation in this country. And actually, there's a real danger that if ordinary working people don't have money in their pay packets, don't get decent pay rises, that sucks demand uh, out the economy. And I think, unfortunately, this government is flirting with the recession. Uh, and actually what they need to do is stop hiding behind the Bank of England, stop hiding behind the wage figures and think about how we tackle inflation in a way that protects the livelihoods of ordinary working people, their families and communities. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the barge that's been off of Portland in Dorset. Um, a lot of the people that we spoke to or who have actually been on media rounds mm -hmm. have said that they, um, they don't want people migrating here because it is somehow liquidating the market for other workers. So the narrative, I suppose, that you read in tabloids or in the right wing press is that more immigration equals lower wages. Is that something that your members talk about at all? Is that a concern that you have? I think lots of members are concerned that employers can exploit migrant workers when they come to this country by paying them under the... Uh, the rate for the job. And listen, I don't care whether someone was born here or somewhere travels here to work. I want them to be paid decently. I want them to be paid the rate for the job. I want them to be unionised and I want them to be treated uh, fairly. Like my grandparents, uh, both grandfathers were migrants to this country. And I, I can't stand the demonisation of migrants, this sort of the, the government's attack on migrants as somehow they're the ones that are causing the problems with our public services. They're the ones responsible uh, for low pay. They're the ones responsible for insecure employment. Actually, the responsibility for all those things lies uh, with the government. Now, I understand in Portland and other areas why people don't think it's a good idea for 500 asylum seekers to be housed on a barge in the middle of a, of a port. I mean, I think that's an appalling way to treat those uh, asylum seekers, but it's not good for the local community either. But this is a government, I'm afraid, that is seeing migration through the lens of, of political advantage. And when you've got a government minister that was prepared to paint over 
murals in a children's reception centre, I think it says everything you need to know about the morals and ethics of this government. And I'm going into September just finally, so we're, we're getting into general election season. What's the plan for the union? Who are you going to be moving towards? What kind of ministers? Are you going Tory or Labour? Where are you? Well, well listen, the TUC isn't affiliated to the Labour Party. A number of our unions are, but I'm very clear that we need a change of government in this country. And what does that mean? It means a Labour government in Westminster, but a government that's going to deliver on the priorities of working people and of unions. And that means that new deal uh, for workers, a ban on zero hours contracts, on fire and rehire, union rights to access the workplace, new fair pay agreements in sectors like social care. I think Labour could make a big difference in Britain's workplaces within that first 100 days uh, of a Labour government. So, you know, I, I, you know, over the course of the next few, few, few months, we'll be trying to get politicians to make sure that they commit to the stuff that matters to our members. At the end of the day, I care about working people, their families, uh, their communities. I know that 13 years of this government have been a disaster for the people that we represent, and it's desperately time that we have a change. What's the key commitment that you need from Starmer? I think that new deal for workers is really important. Uh, uh, all the things that I've talked about, but also the repeal of the anti-union legislation. I mean, part of the reason why dodgy boss bosses can get away with exploiting workers is that unions have had, uh, been tied up in legal knots. It's really difficult for us to organise uh, in workplaces. So I think a Labour government working with unions committed to improving the quality of work in life, committed to driving up people's wages, delivering that new deal, that's my priority over the course of the next 12 months.